uh, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, and West Virginia, and those portions of the Confederacy under Union occupation. The Emancipation Proclamation was an act of military desperation designed to realize two goals. Lincoln hoped first to dissuade the British and the French governments from intervening militarily on behalf of the South. As Lincoln noted, the Emancipation Proclamation would help us in Europe and convince them that, w- that uh, they are incited by something more than ambition. Second, Lincoln hoped to incite slaves to murder defenseless white women and children on the farms and on the cities of the Confederacy in the expectation that the Confederate Army would disintegrate as soldiers abandoned the field to return home to save lives of their family. Lincoln justified this goal by asserting, I have no right. I, I have a right to take any measure which may be best subdue the enemy, nor do I urge objections of the moral nature uh, in view of possible consequences of insurrection and massacre at the South. Okay, I'm going to check this here for a second. Find out what's going on. Okay, he's got a lightning storm. Lenny's got a lightning storm, so we get knocked off. That's reason. I'm here. I just want you to take a, the storm's passing. I just want to take a quick break and let everybody, let the listeners know that Keith is reading from uh, the book called Pandora's Box, The Ultimate Unseen Land, Hand by the New World Order, uh, by uh, Alex Christopher. Okay, I'm going to go over to page 333. Guys, this is getting um, uh, important because J.S. Morgan, or I'm sorry, Charles Schwab is involved in this. Uh, The Reconstruction Period, post-Civil War, trusts and trustees all deals with, guess what, the railroads. Those acts of Reconstruction, the Reconstruction Act. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Lenny and Sam's trying to call you. He tried to call. He tried to call me for some reason. I don't know why he did it, but he tried to call me. Well, I've already skyped him back. Uh, okay, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1885 specifies that you cannot have a monopoly. Armor Meat Packing uh, Company, Standard Oil, and Sugar Trust. Guys, all these things I'm telling you are all owned by the railroad. All these companies are all owned by the railroad. Every bit of it. McDonald's owned by the railroad. The Security Act of 1933, this act was created to stop a uh, continued practice of forcing companies into receivership by economic controls, which caused the subsequent sale of the highest bidder to, at public auction, contingent upon the buyer paying off all outstanding corporate debts. So I'm going to be jumping around, so just deal with you know, just have to deal with it. The members of the family were appointed as trustees for the liquidation. The elder of the, uh, and the father-in-law, most of these trustees, was J.P. Morgan. The trustees were his son, sons-in-law. I'm going to get to the Federal Reserve here in just a few minutes. The railroad, through the third party known as Lancaster Cotton Mills, bought the banks and consolidated them under their own bank. The bank, uh, this bank, was a bank of Lancaster, South Carolina, which incidentally was not a uh, was not a member of the Federal Reserve System. J.P. Morgan, Jack, Jack Whitney, remember these guys, Whitney and Pratt. This is the Whitney of Pratt and Whitney uh, uh, aircraft uh, engines. Whitney Steamships and Whitney Banks, under which the United Fruit, which controls the fruit production in in South America and its importation into the United States, under which is a tropical radio and telegraph, which currently controls most of the transport communications in the Southern Hemisphere. Federal Communications Act of 1934. Every time these guys get ready to do something, it gets really really interesting, okay? Um, Every time they get ready to do something, an act goes in to protect what they're getting ready to do. So all the acts you're reading are acts based on protecting the railroad's interests. That's all they're for. They have nothing to do with you. Zero. People have spent years reading acts. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't do squat. It's there to protect them. I'll give you a perfect example here in just a little while. I'm going to give you some of the, uh, I've got, wait a minute, on the holdings, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six pages of companies, including Bayer Aspirin Company, owned by uh, L.S. Pacier. AT&T, owned by them, all owned by the railroad companies. 
Everything's done through uh, trust. Okay, Sear also owns Southern Power Company, Lancaster Manufacturing Company, the Lancaster Cotton Mill, Bank of Lancaster, um, um, uh, what it was called, the Fertilizer Company, uh, Elgin Watches, Watch Company, Field Watch Company, Waltham Watch Company, Cent uh, Centennial Watch Company, Waterbury Watch Company. He owns uh, uh, Eagle Brand Milk, uh, Heinz Pickle Company, the American Cereal Company, United Fruit Trading Company, uh, Bib Stove and Range Company, Swift and Company, um, let's go Exxon Corporation, BF Goodrich. He owned Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa. Union Silver Company, I'm trying to see some big names, the American Trust and Savings Bank in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama, uh, Bank of South Carolina. Uh, all of, I mean, a buttload of banks. There's a bunch of banks here. Uh, a bunch of cotton mills. Uh, Singer Manufacturing Company, uh, he owns those. Uh, Hartford Sewing Machine, Domestic Sewing Machine, Clark's O&T Cotton Thread Company, J.P. Coates Thread, uh, Southern Power, Duke Power Company, Lancaster Light and Power Company, Potomac Electric Company, and General Electric. He owned General Electric. Y'all never knew they, they owned all these things. Every bit of it owned by the same all, all the same people. Okay, here's an interesting one. Here's Nikolai Tesla. Okay, I'm just going to start somewhere in the middle because it's, 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 it gets into things you don't really need to, it, you can read it yourself. Okay, Tesla was encouraged by friends to take his invention to America, where they would be receptive to the new ideas. He was told that Mr. Edison might be of, and be interested in his invention. The manager of Edison Company in Paris supplied Tesla with a letter of introduction to Edison. Nikolai Tesla arrived in New York in 1884 with four cents in his pocket and a book of poetry, a paper on his thoughts on a flying machine, and his letter of introduction to Edison. Needless to say, the relationship between Edison and Tesla did not work out. Soon after Tesla's run in with more than uh, with more than insecure and greedy Edison, he was quickly grabbed up by one J.P. Morgan to be passed on to L.C. Payseur, P-A-Y-S-E-U-R. Tesla was a private person because of that fact, and little was known about his private life. After Tesla became associated with uh, Morgan and Payseur, he was rushed off, rushed off to Lincolnton, okay, North Carolina, in general area of this country. There, may, uh, there are many records of Tesla having a resident there and owning property there as well. Tesla was invited by Mr. Payseur to come to the Carolinas to create his inventions in alternating current. It was called the Great Falls Experiment. This experiment was conducted on the uh, uh, Cata, Cat, I'm sorry, Catawba River to create an alternating current generator. Tesla was financially backed by Payseur and Morgan. Since you always uh, test a new idea before you take it to public, all bugs were worked out and all that. One of the most famous rivalries to turn the 20th century between George Westinghouse, uh, who was also a Payseur man, and Thomas Alvin, uh, Alva Edison, uh, as to whether AC alternating current or DC current. Uh, okay, that's not interesting. It's just all okay. Uh, let me get into this because he's American. American private for private opportunity to learn about Tesla because his name was seldom mentioned in any school books. Um, this is a this is a, a interesting part. I started firing questions. In other words, there's this one guy that he was getting information from, uh, or he or she was getting information from, and uh, it dealt with this. I had known some things about Tesla, but the part that he played in the Philadelphia experiment was one of the intrigued me the most because it would happen with the battleship in the USS Eldridge, becoming invisible and being transported from one place to another and reappearing. Uh, 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 on one of my bone-picking expeditions with this man, he started uh, taking uh, about the government being uh, able to take a rabbit and make it go invisible and be moved. That he, that he knew a lot more than these things, uh, uh, the, the, about the things that intrigued me. So I'm asking him about, asking him about the unified fields that Einstein perfected and the government is now working with. I had just found out about her, uh, the heir's of grandfather, her, uh, the heir's grandfather, L.C. Pesier, that uh, had been on had been the one backing Tesla in the Great Falls experiment. Everything suddenly clicked with all the information that this man had been feeding me for a month. I started firing questions at him left and right, and all of a sudden this man was uh, just, he stopped answering the questions of what happened. At the top of getting the answer more secret, 
much more secrets about the Philadelphia experiment. This man uh, was telling me that he didn't know anything about it and blah, blah, blah. So he dropped it and, and, and took off. The night after we got home, after uh, uh, she said, so I dropped off in, uh, uh, the search that sunny day and jumped in the Tennessee River for a swim, a cool off. It says, that night we got home from the river, this man calls me, being his usual cheerful self. He says, I thought about things that you asked me today, and now I have the answers for you. Went on, he went on to tell me the proper name of the experiment uh, in question was called Project Rainbow, and that his father had been involved in it. Uh, at that time, he was at the now called, now called the CIA. He went to the great detail to tell me how it was operated and more. This uh, uh, has been the backbone of many astonishing inventions of technology. I asked if the case to your family because it was a financial backer of Tesla what had inherited the plans and his dream plans uh, to his dreams and plans of untold technology. I'd never gotten the answer to this question, just a dumb and knowing look. So if you want to know where all this stuff is going, all these things you guys are, it's all, it's all in the pace of your family. Now what they say is in the 30s and 40s, uh, somehow the Springsteen family once uh, uh, um once uh, J. Uh, L. C. P. Shear uh, died, that they took it over. My guess, I, guess, I think the same family. I think it's still the same P. Shear family. They just changed their name to Spring. <laughs> that's my guess. I'm not. That, that's. I have no basis in fact on that. Okay, and I'm gonna f try to find. I think it was the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve part was interesting because you're gonna know. Um, okay, 419. You'll go to 419, you'll see the, the Federal Reserve uh, story. It's very interesting how that came about, and it was all done by these same people. Okay. Many of you know and read elements of history recounted by Ralph Epperson, Eustace Mullins, and Lindsay Williams, but you must realize that none of these uh, authors know the information behind the events they describe. As a result, their work amounts to superficial coverage at best. You are advised to get a good uh, grip on your armchair because you are about to see in print for the first time the information about the Federal Reserve has never been seen in the light of day before. In 1893, a panic, which was engineered by the railroad bankers, okay, was in progress. They used to be called railroad bankers <laughs> because the railroads were bankers, were banks. They just started, in other words, to keep them from getting robbed, they just started putting them in... Uh, in buildings, but actually that building is owned by the railroad. Okay, so you got to realize that. So the gold reserve in the U.S. Treasury held only 80 million, far too little for the United States to go on redeeming currency in gold. President Cleveland called a special session, uh, a session of Congress in August 1993 to repeal the Silver Purchase Act that was depleting the reserve. He was hotly opposed by the silver contingent of his own party. The act was repealed, but no legislation was made to protect the uh, reserve in any, in any other way. People began to hoard gold. Business failed, and banks crashed everywhere. Now, guys, this was in 1893. Y'all just knew about eight, nine, or we all just knew about 1933. This happened in 1893. People began to hoard gold. Business failed, and banks crashed everywhere. National bank deposits fell 378 million. The silver dollar dropped from 67 cents to 60 uh, in value. The western silver mines shut down. By winter 1893, everything was worse. Thousands were jobless, hundreds starved. Coxies, Coxies, a, a spectacular horde of unemployed uh, marched to Washington to plead redress. They arrived in front of the White House May 1, 1894, but all the government uh, uh, could do was arrest them for walking on the grass. Workers in Pullman Car Company, Chicago, struck a protest against uh, cut wages. The strike spread in seven states, seven states and involved 23 railroads. Railroad property cars and buildings were burned, trains were stopped, and mails obstructed. True history was probably being uncovered. Okay, hold on one second. I'm getting all kinds of... Holy crap, 186.9 megabytes. That's going to take a while. All right. <laughs> That's how big that book is. Okay. Now, it says, uh, uh, true history, it says, the people of uh, this era probably uh, possibly knew who was behind the control of money and were, were rebelling. 
Do you see what, the, what was going on here, guys? They started rebelling in 1893. It got out who was running things, that everything was run by the railroads. They didn't, have, they didn't own their property. They figured that out. They didn't own any of the mineral rights of their property. They figured that out. That's what happened. This is why this book is so important. All right, the people of this era, okay, blah, blah, blah. Government Aldridge of, of Illinois, who sympathized with the strikers, would do nothing. But uh, President Cleveland sent federal troops to quell the agitation and keep the mail moving. The U.S. Supreme Court, by injunction, forbade interference with the movement of trains. You hear that? The U.S. Supreme Court, by injunction, forbade interference with the movement of trains. Who do you think owned the U.S. Supreme Court? That's their government, okay? It, and almost everything in the Patriot Act has to deal with trains, too. Yeah, every bit of it. All right, there was bloodshed and war between the troops and the strikers. Peace was restored at the end by July 1894, but Cleveland's interference cost him the support and organized labor and his sympathizers. I will inject here something that I found out about President Cleveland in the years since I wrote the book. Cleveland spent a lot of time in Paris, France, because he was the grand master of the Illuminati, and it was uh, and and was having an affair with the Queen of the Grand Lodge, and she was behind controlling him, and that's what he did in this country, and it was one of the uh, uh, and was the one who ordered him killed. I've written whole he's written, written a whole book about it. All right, the whole 1893-94 panic, and everything was planned so that the Paysier family, acting on behalf of the Virginia Company, hello, the Paysier family. Acting on behalf of the Virginia Company, could uh, okay. Now the Virginia Company at that time was what the United States of America. So the Pacier family, through beneficiaries, as beneficiaries through a trust, through their trustees, act on behalf of the Virginia Company, which is on behalf of the United States of America. So if they change it in their trust, eventually it turns into an act of Congress. Okie dokie. He says, could at least take control of every railroad and railway banking concern in this county. He says, remember the family held the financial notes for construction of the railroads, rails, rolling stock, etc. They had taken the congressionally granted railroad land, grand patent or grant patents, as collateral for the debt the railroad company owed to Pacier Banks of New York for building the railroads. They own all of it, and they they make put themselves into debt and everything. <laughs> By orchestrating a financial crash in this county, the railroads um, I'm sorry, the railroads uh, could, pay, uh, could not pay their notes, and all railroad companies were seized by the banks in foreclosure. The Paysiers became the absolute owner, and then they turned around, and J.P. Morgan, L.C. Paysiers head trustee, created a plan to lease all of the railroad companies out, of operating, uh, out to operating companies in the form of Southern Railroad Lease of 1894. So what, what did they do? They caused violence to get control of more railroads so that they could lease them. The same thing they just did in the Civil War. It worked so well in the Civil War. Why did they just do it in 1893? So just to refresh your memories, you already have discovered in earlier chapters, the railroad owns most uh, every odd section of land in the United States and bought many even sections of land, too. Along with this, they got the mineral rights also, and the list goes on. This means that the landlord, Louis Caspier, owned all of the minerals in the ground everywhere. He also had railroad land and other claims, including gold and silver deposits. The family already had a federal monopoly for the control of railroads and banks and had the desire to make the United States dollar the strongest form of money in the world by continuing to back all the currency in the United States with gold and silver, all of which he owned anyways. So this family has, even to this day, a way of creating companies years in advance and then getting laws written to prevent anyone else from infringing on their monopoly. In 1894, a seemingly inconspicuous company was formed in North Carolina. It was incorporated, the Northern Carolina Gold Company, Body, po body Politic Incorporation. You hear what I just said? The North Carolina Gold Company, a Body Politic Incorporation. This document is included in this chapter which means that, this, this, that it is a private company and is owned by an individual person or persons, in this case a person. 
this little company was owned by a railroad by the name of the Charleston, Cincinnati, and Chicago Railroad, which was also the owner of some 36 banking houses. The Charleston, Cincinnati, and Chicago Railroad is a wholly owned subsidiary of Lancaster and the Chester Railroad Company. A secret meeting took place in November 19, uh, of 1910 in a little tucked away place by the name of Jekyll Island in, in uh, Georgia at a hunt creed, creed to have been owned. Uh, I'm sorry, pro, uh, pro, he spelled that wrong. It's supposed to be purported. Uh, to have been owned by none other than J.P. Morgan. In fact, it was a private club owned by the railroad owner, Louis Cass Pacier, who had a passion for hunting, and especially duck hunting. It gets more interesting with, the, with this in just a few minutes. Some of the people that attended was Pyatt, Frank Vanderclip, I'm sorry, it was uh, A. Pyatt, Frank Vanderclip, Henry P. Davison, Charles D. Norton, Benjamin Strong, Paul Warburg, and Nelson Aldrich. You will notice that there is no mention of the Rothschild in this list because at the time the Rothschilds were not involved with the Federal Reserve Plan. It was not until some time later that the Rothschilds became involved with it, and only then because of the death of Louis Caspier in 1938 and the subsequent embezzlement by the Rothschilds' cousins that Leroy Springs family descendants. It, it was only a natural that J.P. Morgan would be pushing the passage of the Federal Reserve Act because he was the main trustee for all of the Caspier companies that had been placed into trust with Morgan. Other, the other men that were involved with the Jekyll Island trip were all life estate trustees for the Pacier family dynasty. Remember that the Paysiers, uh had a monopoly on banking in America, which meant all of them fell under the, uh, their control in some manner. Congressman Lindbergh testified before the Committee on Rules, December 15, 1911, after the Aldrich plan to put the Federal Reserve into place had been introduced in Congress, said, our financial system is a false one and a huge burden on the people. I have alleged that there is a money trust. The Aldrich plan is a scheme plainly in, uh, in the interest of the trust. Why does the money trust uh, press so hard for the Aldrich plan now before the people know what the money trust has been doing? Lindbergh was right, and it was, it was to become the largest money trust ever. It became another part of the secret hidden trust that is part of the power control in the world, which goes back to the Virginia, uh, original Virginia Company and is assembling uh, of the Federal Reserve of England. The Federal Reserve Bank, it, as it is known today, is owned by, owned by Charleston, Cincinnati, and Chicago Railroad. The Fed is comprised of 1,503 congressional districts and 364 of the referenced Fortune 500 companies by the Pacier Monster that has been leased out on a 99-year lease, soon to be up on the dates of June 17, 1993 and December 31, 1993. If by some wild stroke of luck the people wake up and take uh, the power back, or we have, uh, or we have new tenants lease all of this land and take control away from those uh, from the tyrants, they are now in control. Things might start to change. It says here there are no uh, promises being made for a brighter future. The tyrants that control the Fed and other trust companies, once controlled by J.P. Morgan, are very powerful. What I am telling you here is not hard to see if you only open your eyes and ears and start putting this giant puzzle together. And the truth given to you for the very first time. Okay, it can be proven with the courthouse and federal documents and not by half-baked ideas by those who only read the newspapers and history books that have, uh, have and are written by the ones that have been in control for a very long time. <clears throat> okay, uh, he says, the enormous national debt load, debit load, that this country is laboring under was created out of nothing for something for, uh, that is nothing. The Federal Reserve charges the United States interest on the paper money, and their form of banking system is almost exclusive to the Federal Reserve Bank. It is called the uh, Reg Y instrument, and uh, that are almost uh, uh, that are almost extinct now. I think it's extinct now. So now uh, that is why the New York banks that are railroads, okay, which are grandfathered into the system, have a 15 to 1 ratio banking and is called fractional reserve banking, created something out of nothing. you got to realize, I want you to remember that, because in the paperwork that we're going to be doing, uh, uh, we're going to have to remember these, these terms, 15 to 1 and all that stuff, because that's what we're going to be dealing with when dealing with these uh, mortgages. Okay? So the banks that operate on the, uh, on the Reg Y principle can write checks 15 times over for every dollar they are holding. 
That is power. And we have to pay interest on the excess money that the Fed prints to cover the $15 that are created from every $1 that is really held by the bank. Today, there is supposed to be a man by the name of Greenspan directing the affairs of the Federal Reserve. But this is not the truth of the matter. The person that controls the Federal Reserve and the rest of the world is the descendant of Leroy Springs. His great-great-granddaughter, Crandall Close Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S, that's C-R-A-N-D-A-L, C-L-O-S-E, B-O-W-L-E-S, who sits as a director in the Federal Reserve Building in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay? That's the chick right there that is screwing everybody. Her name is Crandall Close, C-L-O-S-E, Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S. I call it Bowles. <laughs> so... <laughs> This was the history behind the bills, okay? And this is only one small paragraph. I wanted you all to hear this. Uh, it says, let us review some past history of the Pacer and Beatty families, okay? The year is 1757. A paper manufacturer by the name of Beatty invented a special woven type of paper called chameleon paper. That's where you guys are getting a chameleon, 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 okay, paper. The paper was extremely durable, readily accepted special magnetic inks, and contained a unique mix of almost microscopic fibers, most white, some red, some green. The Beatty paper mill was, in, uh, was on the Yatkin River in North Carolina, still produces this special paper today, and it is the sole supplier under great secrecy to the Federal Reserve printing mills. The reason why they don't want you to know that is because they don't want you to know. They want to make it sound like it's being some mystery. Uh, they don't want you to know that because they don't want you to link it back to the railroads. That's what they don't want you to do. It is the paper from which the currency of the United States of America is made. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank caused, caused legislation to be enacted to the effect that it would be thereafter illegal to even attempt to make a paper like it. See what I'm talking about, guys? Whenever something comes up, they have a, a legislation that comes in to protect their interests. That's exactly what they're doing. They're the ones that made that legal tender. The rare... Anyone still there? I'm here, but I don't know where Keith went. Karen Marie here, Sparks. Okay, well, I guess he must have gotten uh, dropped. And I heard uh, John's voice asking if anybody was there. Are you there, John? I'm still there. I don't know how many of the rest of us are there. I, I think we ought to just hold on and let him see if he can dial into this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll be back on in a minute. Is that you, Darcy? Hot damn, I get okay, it. Okay, hold on, we're back. Uh, sorry, right. we just had a little malfunction. It's still recording, I believe. Yeah, the recording's still on. So, where did Keith stop off? We only we were only off a few seconds. Keith just need to back up a little bit. That's all. Okay, we're, well, like, we're talking about chameleon paper. Yep. Yes. Okay, okay. We'll just, all right. Well, I'll start there. Continue to mute out, and uh, Keith will continue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I won't be too much longer, guys. I'm not going to take up your whole night on this. So, as all right, the paper was extremely durable, readily accepted special magnetic inks, and contained a unique mix of almost microscopic fibers, most white, some red, some green. The Beatty paper uh, mill was on the Yadkin River in North Carolina, still produces this special paper today. It is the sole supplier under great secrecy to the Federal Reserve printing mills. And the reason why they have this as a great secrecy, I don't know if I said this before or if you all heard me, they don't want you to link this back to the railroads. That's why all this is so important, because they don't want you to link it back in any way, shape, or form. It, says, it, it, it is the paper from which the currency of the United States of America is made. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank caused legislation to be enacted to the effect that it would be thereafter illegal to even attempt to make paper like it. Y'all remember what I was saying? Whenever they come up with a new idea, they cause legislation to protect the idea, and then they move forward. The Pacier family bought this paper mill after the Civil War because uh, that the Beat, uh, Beatleys lost everything for acts of treason. 
Okay? Isn't that amazing? For acts of treason. <laughs> the patient How do you spell later that later name? Years, found a use for this. Beatley? B-E-A-T-L-Y. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, guys. Please mute out. We're recording this. There are going to be other listeners that want to listen. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's all right. It's all right. It's, it's okay. It's all but right. We're at the end, we can, we can open it up to questions, and we can have some dialogue. Let's we'll keep finish up. All right, it's B-E-A-T-T-Y. There's the Beatty families. And then Beatleys, and he spelled it different, differently here, for, uh, lost everything for acts of treason. What I think it was of the Beatleys, uh, Beatty families. <clears throat> okay, it's B-E-A-T-T-Y. It says, uh, the Pace years and the later, later years found a use for this very special paper. And in, one f- uh, in, in, and in fact, one of the Pace years family elders told an interesting story one day about how when she was a young girl and her family was living in Washington, D.C. with her grandfather, L.C. Pacier, they, uh that's how I know how, uh, how to uh, pronounce it there, there was a special session in the house that she would visit that had been converted into a printing company, which her uncle operated to print the money that was soon to come into use in the United States. The year was around 1909. And the inscription on the money said, Federal Reserve Note. It is unknown when or if those bills were ever put into circulation. What do you think? (laughs) That's the main thing I wanted you guys to see because these were answers I've been looking for for quite a long time on who controls what, when, and where. In this book... You have J.D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil, and World Monopolies, and even has some of his um, his uh, um, uh, his certificates from his his corporations. It shows all the corporations they're involved with. Has every family name whatsoever. If you are ever in any way, shape, or form, if you are ever injured in any way, shape, the railroad has an insurance company, and that's who you claim against. I don't care if it, the, the judge did what. Don't don't mess with the judges. Don't mess with the prosecutors. Don't mess with uh, the cops. Don't mess with any of them. Go after the railroad company in that area. That is their town. They're the ones that run it. They're the ones that own it. And they have an insurance policy on it from the railroad companies. You start doing that, you'll never be screwed with again. Keith, there was one thing that you that I didn't hear you mention, and that we spent a lot a lot of time talking about last night, and that was the fact that when they bought, then when they acquired the railroads uh, initially, and then the railroads from the Confederacy, uh, they had contracts in place that said that they could never be messed with in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. You, um, what was the, what was the part of that? I don't that? I don't remember it. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, it, they could do legislation on anything but the railroads is basically what their contracts with the government were. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. I remember that part. I know, I know what you're talking about there. And I don't know now, where um, that was. Uh, yeah, Keith, I grew up in Cincinnati. I remember uh, PPL uh, filing their injuries against the railroad. Absolutely. Guys, this is information that has been lost. All right? It's not because we're stupid. It's not because we just, it, we just didn't know. Okay, because we grew up in a way on the other side of the veil, of the corporate veil. We didn't see what was going on. And this company, as, as, as many people have been um, uh, raised in, in this country, all you see is what happens in that town. You don't see who owns the town or who's behind it, or actually what you were born and raised to do. What you were born and bred to do was to make sure the railroad companies make more money. That's what you're here to do. That's what they raised you to do. As far as they're concerned, they gave you, I'm sorry, the people. All right. Okay, PPL, people. <clears throat> um, yeah, you, you got to not use those acronyms for me. I, I am not a, I'm not a, uh, a tweeter. <laughs> I don't get all those. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, they raised you to work for them. That's what was done. That's what you learn in school. That's why you go to school. That's why you uh, uh, all the clothes that you have on your back, that's why all these things are supplied. It's not because you're loved. It's because you're there to protect the railroads and their interests. I'm not saying that's your purpose. I'm saying that's what they said your purpose was. 
Okay, so and that's what's going on. You want to open this up? To, I'm sure some folks have some questions. Oh yeah, uh, we we need a lot of different points of view here. We need a lot of different things to, so that we can share those different points of view with everybody that listens to this recording. Because the, the that's folks just that over you guys, this is this is 600 and something pages. Um, there's no way I'm going to be able to go through a, a recording of 600 pages. So uh, they'll have to get it themselves. All right. Unmute. And let's rock and roll, guys. We're unmuted. I know somebody gets Anybody have question. any questions, comments? So, no. so somebody mentioned something about uh, having the maps of the railroads. Is that Dorothy? Those are actually in the book. Oh, those are in the book. Okay. Yeah, everything is in the book. All the trust documents of the original trusts and everything they have and all the terms and conditions of those trusts are in the book. They made them a matter of public record. I remember um, we were we were going on this path of the registered agent of the all cap legal name. I remember that, and one uh, we pushed it so far as the judge finally came out and said those are trusts, meaning that the uh, the bank that this uh, we thought that this guy was creating out of thin air, this uh, attorney, those were trusts that were recognized by the federal government, is what he said. That's what the judge said that that bank was. They're freaking trust owned by these these families, these nine barren families, and um, uh, they're uh, they're loaning you uh, uh, money at nothing, fifteen to one. Not loaning you squat. They're renting it to you. That's why you're called a tenant by the railroad. But it's very cunningly disguised within the. I mean, people have been studying uh, what do you call that? Uh, um. Uh, uh, fraud and mortgages for years. Still didn't pick it up. This is Cheryl. I have a... Is this a... <laughs> I just looked it up on Amazon for the book. And they're both... They have two of them in paperback, and one of them is a 1992... And the other one is a 2007 revised edition. Which one would be the one? Keith, wasn't it the Millennium Edition? Yeah, yeah, it was a Millennium Edition. I just got what That's you were saying. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just curious, Cheryl, what are they yeah. selling that one for? $528.02. Yeah, last <laughs> night, last night when we were just reading this um one of the guys we were on the phone, 399 yeah they were 399 shipped wow that was last night they were it was one penny and 399 shipped oh my goodness because john was making a joke about it wow but this information has been out there for some time and it's my understanding that um a lot of the books most of the books have been acquired taken off the market so to speak i wonder who did that and uh uh but there are some versions out there now i know that darcy on our skype group uh put up there the uh the file that you could download the online book the pdf but i know cheryl you're you have until you uh do your resident Right. Uh, declaration you won't be able to get on the Skype group maybe when yeah. you after you do that and you're on we, somebody will send it to you awesome well I it's ordered okay so it's on its way yeah well we're uh, how this how this came about how I got I've had this book for years oh. I just never read it <laughs> um, uh, Rio Fay gave me this book Rio did I don't know if y'all know who she is but she gave me this book, and she says, Keith, you got to read this book. And I'm thinking, man, 600 pages? Damn. I'm going to start reading this stuff. <laughs> but I was not ready yet. I wasn't ready to, to hear this information. This information came to me absolutely perfectly on the day that I needed it. This is when we were trying to reform PEGA, how, how we, uh, um, you know, we're trying to... Uh, uh, do different um, um, angles on how to deal with the system and everything else, and now we know exactly who the problem is and what's going on. 
and it came per, at a perfect time, right when we're offering Iceland uh, our uh, uh, our president status, their president, our, our head of state status, right when the United States of America has come together, right when we put everything in, uh, you know, uh, uh, did not break the chain of title between the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation, everything coming together, a new state coming on. Um, two more states coming on to the Confederacy and everything, all at the same time. It was all perfect timing. I picked up the book because we started talking. I started picking up the book. And I started reading through it, and I hit some of those pages, and I go, oh, my God, here it is. This is exactly what we needed. Right at the exact time we needed it. So I, I sent Rio a uh, thank you um uh, email and offered uh, if she would get a hold of Paga, get a hold of Will, um, to be a part of the, um, the Private Attorney General's Association because she's been studying this stuff for quite a long time, and we need what she knows. And I've met her face to face. She's come to my house, and she's hilarious. <laughs> As far as she's she's a lot of fun to be around. So does somebody hang up? No, I think they just muted out. Oh, okay. You know, I think probably right, so they're digesting the information that you just put out there because it's a lot to take in, Keith. And uh, this may be a good time, unless somebody has another question, it may be a good time to end this recording. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's fine. Anybody have a question a lot before of people you? Like the on, record, uh, on, re on recording either. So, yeah, that's true. Keith, uh, I got in all here. I got into this kind of light. Um, uh, can you summarize for me what you're saying? Are you saying that kind of the railroad is the is the kingpin even above the Federal Reserve? The railroad owns the Federal Reserve. Railroad owns the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Yeah, they own they own Washington D.C. They own the U.S. Senate, the Supreme Court, the President, everything. They own all of it. Hmm. They're the ones that started it. And how does that relate, Keith, to you know what we've been trying to figure out, whether it be the Crown or you know the courts? I mean, are they only do they? I mean, how is that tied to the crown as well? Um, it relates to it. Uh, there's other sections in there in the book that need to be looked at, okay? It does relate because uh, they are in business with them. They're all basically in business together. The syndicate? Okay, so, yeah, that's a lot of, yeah, I have, yeah, it's a syndicate. I have not gotten into the details of that particular part yet, of how the crown works its way in. Uh, I just sort of picked up the book two days ago. So um, uh, if uh, uh, there's a download of it, um, all the all those questions can be answered right there in the first couple of chapters. It even goes to the history of the Vatican and everything else. A lot of this started in Jerusalem. Any indication? And also, uh, is there anything here to make you think that we're on the wrong path? Who are you asking? You. No, I'm asking you. I mean, I... I mean, I know what the answer is, but no. I mean, I'm, I'm sure people out there listening are wondering. Uh, well, I wonder what if they're if they're still if they think they're on the right path. No, if if you've been studying this stuff for 20 years, okay, what happens is this is called accumulated knowledge, and there are questions you had from a long time ago that were answered in the book. And I go, oh, my God, there it is right there. I got that close to it, and that's why they reacted the way they reacted. Those kind of things. That's why they got quiet. That's why this happened. That's why that happened. Even Will did the same thing today. He goes, oh, man, I was that close to him. <laughs> and that's why they reacted the way they reacted. <laughs> Keith, I'm trying to catch up here. Uh, are we kind of saying here is the, the railroad, railroad ra laid out the tracks. It kind of had some claim over the land? Had a claim over all of it. They tried to. What they've been doing is they've been acquiring uh, land illegally that's what they've been doing they say they own all of it how can you own all of that in a matter of 50 years 
you got to be cheating somewhere. Mm-hmm. You cannot acquire that much in 50 years unless you're doing some stealing. <laughs> they manipulated the system that they put together. They put the system together. They loan they loan money to their own companies. And then take those companies yeah. over. See, if somebody wants to be a part of the railroad, this is what they do. If you want to start a railroad, you can do that, all right? But eventually what's going to happen is you're going to loan it, but you're going to lose it. And then they're going to they're going to uh, foreclose on it and then lease it to you. That's what they're going to do to control it. So they took your labor that you that you did to uh, to put that railroad or uh, railway uh, system together and your own trains and everything else, and then they foreclose on you, lease it back to you, and then they control it. That's how they do it. They use things politically. Everything's done politically. Jake, if I this is Brad, if I understand correctly, if you have every, anything from a, a traffic ticket on up to a, a major criminal case, you sue the railroads. Yeah, that's exactly where you got to go. Any anything, absolutely any case, you sue the railroads. Any case, any case. How did you injure the railroad? That's the case. You did not injure the railroad in any way, shape, or form, so how in the hell are they prosecuting you? Yeah, but they're they're subject to their their, uh, slave masters injured us, so we want to go after them. We'd still go after the railroads, correct? every, Every time, the railroads. No matter what you do, you go after the railroad. If it's a mortgage foreclosure, you go after the railroad. Thank you. You go after the owner of the company. Yeah. So, so I have a question to, to pile on the railroad here, and that is the interstate highways across America. Do you think they may be an extension of the railroad? Okay. If, if uh, L.C. Pierre owned the mineral rights that made the highway, what they're doing is they're putting the asphalt on the ground, taking the, um, the, the deeds, okay, um, of, the, of the land that's on there, that the, that the highway is on. They're keeping the mineral rights to themselves and li- licensing it to you for use under lease. Do, do, do I need to say that again? Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay. If you own the mineral rights to the asphalt, okay, and you put this highway in, then the asphalt that was on your train, it was delivered to those people that put the asphalt on the ground. You keep the mineral rights. Now, anybody that uses it, they lease it to you, and then they license you for it. That's where a license comes from. They own the mineral rights to the asphalt that was put on the ground. They take all the deeds of that ground, put the asphalt on there, they own the roads, and then they license it to you for use in a form of a lease. That's what they're doing. One one of the points that you made was as they laid the railroad down across America that they would create cities in support of putting down the railroad. And it seems to me as they has put international, uh, excuse me, uh, the highway system across America, that they would do the same thing, that every city was created yeah. for the same support. Yeah, and they also own all the, all the motor companies that created the cars and all the minerals that created the car. The steel. They built the car. The steel. The steel, everything. The iron, everything. And then they license it to you. They license everything to you is what they're doing. And it's under a mm-hmm. lease. That's why you got to pay a, a uh, um, you gotta, they give you the money to give them. It's their money. And they've got a, 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 an inclusion or a, a monopoly on the paper that the money is printed on. And then they made it illegal for anybody else to use the paper. 
They charge Do you, you get the point now? <laughs> they charge you interest on it. This is just one big, huge antitrust thing. Yeah, it's enormous. And we're so we were so close for so long that they were leaving us alone because they didn't want to piss us off because we would get more. We get more information because you make them matter. John, how, John, how and many? And they keep going. How many uh, companies did you say this family owns? I've got a list of them here of fifteen hundred. All, yep. main, everything, okay? John Deere, yep. Peter Bolt, all the motor companies. Uh, Exxon. Yeah. Exxon. Mac, Mac International Dresser, Caterpillar, Komatsu, all of it. IBM, 3M, Chevrolet, Dodge, Pontiac, Ford. General know, Motors. Got it. Bill. Yeah. And yeah, everybody everybody used tax money to bail out those companies, didn't they? Yeah. So what you what do you do? You bankrupt the company to to pull a bunch of uh, of their money out of the system, back into their hands. It's the same people every time. The same pe- Clinton is involved with these people. Yeah. They all He's are involved with the spring. Uh, Gore is involved with the springs. Yeah. All of them, you become president when you become a part of these people. All your entertainment industry, everything, these are the people that own it. The railroad owns um, uh, Disneyland, Disney World. They own uh, um, uh, MGM. They own TriStar. They own Columbia. They own every bit of it. Well, they, they would also own Skype and Google and Intel and, and those companies. Exactly. Yeah, all AT&T. They own AT&T because that was a telephone and telegraph uh, lines that went, across, uh, that went across America right next to where? The railroad, the, railroad, uh, the, uh, the train tracks. Stephen Michael. That's where it all started. Stephen, did you, that, that thing that you put out the other day about... Um, uh, that what that global internet you know service that they're trying to produce out of Switzerland. Yes, yeah, it's the W band. W Swan band. Set. Swan, yeah, Swan set. You, you starting to see a pattern there? <laughs> thing, man, thing, man. Except they're going to take it globally over us out in space. No different. There's their intention. Same family, same thing. They own all the minerals to everything they do. That's why it takes them so long to start a new company. It may take them 15 years because what they're doing is they, uh, uh, they're supplying their own companies. So they have to own all the companies so they can supply that company to do a specific thing. And then they have to get all the mineral rights to it, and that way they don't own any, uh, owe anything to anybody. Well, they, they would own NASA. Yeah. And before they put it on the market, they go back there and write legislation so they can't be sued or, or lose any portion of it. So whether you work, for, so whether you work for the U, U.S. government or one of the major corporations, um, you're really, or the Federal Reserve, or one of the banks, really, in essence, you're working for the railroad company. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what's going on. Yeah. Or the Spring family, who said that they, they were told that the Spring family went in and took over all his assets, which I don't think they did. I think they're the same family. They create families out of thin air. Mm-hmm. Family names, they change their family name. They do all kinds of stuff. Same people all the time. Yeah. Every one, time. One of, the, one, one of them just married the... Uh, uh, in the, in the uh, Queen family. Really? Gives an, yeah. Gives, um, gives the new meaning to the word Miller. warp. Excuse me. So, Keith, what yeah, do we Miller. do about Miller this? What do we do with this family. information? What you can do is this. Look what we've done. All right? Look what we've done. We brought in the okay. original Confederacy. Yes, sir. Continue. They abandoned like it. We brought in the Go ahead, John. And then you just like we've been going, do all of our paperwork, put it in correctly, because they cannot operate without a government. 
even as big as they are, they got to have a government to operate from. Their fictitious government up there has been exposed. Now they're vulnerable. And so there, all we've got to do is continue. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, you're a government now. Yep. you got the original Confederacy, and you got a legal government. Six. Okay. Now that now that you have that, okay, they have to hear it and they have to listen to it. They cannot. They we know for a fact that the the Congress up there has been working for them. That's their Congress, not yours. That belongs to the railroad families. Mm-hmm. So you never you've never seen a government that has anything to do with of by and for the people. You've never seen that in your lifetime until now. That was never yours. I got a question, Keith. The U.S. Navy was uh, commissioned under the Articles of Confederacy, right? Mm Mm-hmm. They're free. There's someone in the Navy that knows this because every time one of the military enlisted comes into a corporation court, they are pulled out of that court and they are not allowed to adjudicate it. That's right. And there is something. That's right, because that keeps the difference. Now, uh, now all the information and accumulated knowledge I've had in the last six years verifies exactly what's going on, what the military has been trying to say for the last six years. Every bit of it. I know exactly what they're talking about, who they're talking about, and talking about the nine barren families. That they've been doing their best to keep them away from the original Confederacy. That, that original confederacy is there. We fixed the illegalities of it. We fixed a lot of things as the council did, okay? And now it's time, guys. It's ready. We're ready to go. So, Keith? And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the military does not like the Baron families. They don't want nothing to do with them. And that's what I've witnessed over the past couple of years. <clears throat> David just put a a veil right over us. Do you know that? Do you realize it? Yes, you Can you explain that, Will? Hmm. Well, we're trying to find that. I, uh, when I was getting ready to go in the Navy, the there is more to an officer's duties than just the military. He can step over entities, and now I understand. Basically, I think they stated this. You can step into a court and take over the court as an officer of the military. That's correct. I got to find the proof. That's what we're looking for. And so now that once we hold the rank of lieutenant, uh, lieutenant commander, that means we're a part of the Navy, which is not a part of. Uh, we're under their protection now. As far as their trustees are not under these nine families. There's that's, uh, there's something in there. We got to find it. Yeah, we got to find know, that because there's a connection there. From, Will, from what I have seen, uh, Will, I tried to send that to you last night. Uh, please, we can't find it. Don't say can't. That's not in our vocabulary. I'll try to to send it over. I'll send it to you again. We just haven't found it yet. I sure would appreciate any any ideas in how to research that. I'm pulling my hair out trying to find that for PAGA. I have a so, feel. I have a feeling it's in the trust documents in the in the book. Isn't a lot of it in the legal. We got a bunch of original trust documents in there. Okay. We we got to go through those trusts and find out where their limitations are. Okay. Are you trying to find out how to be a lieutenant commander or what? What are you trying to find out? I want to find out how a naval officer stands in relation to we the people so that we know how to address the military as they help us with arrests or whatever else we have to do of that sort. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, but the, I yeah. need that okay. we the people, all right, I can tell you that. I already don't know the answer to that one. We the people were the railroad companies that owned everything. That's who that belonged to. When you go by we the people um, and you use those terms, that's why what what I was saying the other night on the on the group I said once we have states come in we have got to change everything from grantors the the people back over to we the independent states 
That's a true confederacy. We had to start it out the way we started it out because there were no states involved in it that were actually complete. Okay, but once we got a good complete state, you got like two or three of them. All right, maybe California Republic, then you got Nevada and, and all that. Once they come in, all right, then it's be, then it gets changed one more time to we the independent states, and the people Thank are completely taken out. Thank you. Uh, that's what I was trying to express and didn't know how to do it. So I've I've been doing my best not to take a stab at this, but from what I have seen and what I have heard, it seems as if Rusa is a property of these railroad banks. You got it. <laughs> They're in a corporation. They were complaining about a corporation from a corporation. And and yeah, even the new it, contract, it, it, it began as an ASR. The new contract forces people. People will now be told, if you will not sign to this new contract, you are no longer a part of RUSA, and people are just going along because they want to get along. They think it's a republic, and it's actually the Virginia Company, owned by the railroad. Just it would just change the name to the United States of America. Yep. And and we continue to use that we the people, and it's interesting in the Republic Congress or the Rusa Congress, how often acts are passed by that House and Senate. And, and I'm thinking from the discussion tonight, I'm, my word, it must be the property of these railroad banks. Yeah. It absolutely is. It's a corporation that used to be called the Virginia Company. That particular organization right there. This is getting exciting, gentlemen. So now gentlemen. we have the Confederacy back. Yeah, I know. This part right here, how they used, okay, how the southern states, this is where we have our angle, and this is the cool part, okay? They cannot say that we were in rebellion of the original republic. They cannot say that. And they can't say that we're in a rebellion of the original confederacy because the southern states were moved over and tried to start a new confederacy away from the original Article of Confederation. When they did that, there is something there which I know is true, that that original government is there. That's why John was saying they cannot operate without a government. He was saying that specifically. And the reason why he's saying that is because the original government was the Articles of Confederation. Now that we took that, uh, after it was abandoned, revamped the thing, signed it, and everything else, we became parties to it. So if the railroad companies come after us, that's treason. And they can go down for it. And anybody that becomes a part of it, and any of the states that become a part of it. Keith, explain that treason tie-in. Treason against whom and to whom? If they were the only company... The that had the only thing, how are they going to stand? And is it treason against us? It's a tre it's treason against the original Confederacy, the original government that was actually put in. They're the Articles of Confederation. Yep. Their body politic, the way it's the way it's written and the way it's being used, is actually denying the people any form of government whatsoever. Oh, John. And it makes them liable. That makes them liable and it makes them a, a, a violation of the international uh, law of nations and amongst other things, which is treasonous throughout the, even, even treasonous to the uh, yeah, law of nations because they're denying the free people their lawful government. Go ahead, Keith. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just uh, answering this because he said, uh, he said, uh, so Keith, do you believe that? Do you believe that all railroads are under the same umbrella? And says, I don't believe it. The facts are read that all the railroads are under the same umbrella. <laughs> it's not what I believe that matters. It matters what the facts are, and the facts are very simple. They're all owned by the same nine families. Yep. Every one of them. Well, these, these nine families, I wonder if they are related to the king over there in England, if they are related to uh, the crown. Oh, he's saying, uh, Blue Lotus, he says, so which, 
So which railroad should we sue? I said, the, the one closest to it. <laughs> the one. Okay. The 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 town that where the tort happens, and this is why they came to say when it came in with a saving with the suitors, because they knew what was going on, so they created the saving with the suitors clause, so those guys could could uh, sue for torts and they could sue for uh, um, for for uh, what do you call that um, uh, treaty violations. Okay, and those were the people within the Articles of Confederation and the original government. Okay, and those were citizens and nationals of those independent states. Those are what they call saving of the suitors clause. You can sue for tort, you can sue for treaty violation because that's how it applies. So the tort is very simple: um, uh, 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 conspiracy to kidnap or kidnap and uh, subject, making you a subject of the railroad. The nearest railroad to that courthouse is the one you go after. Whoever is in that county, that railroad is where you go after and you go get their insurance company. You can do the same thing with all the foreclosures and everything else. Now, I'm not saying, hey, we got to go to war with these guys. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, you have a comprehensive way to defend yourself, and that's all that matters. You have a way to do it where you will get reaction. Heart, I mean, real quick, because there's only nine families. There's 300 million people in this country. Yeah, you wonder why they tried to kill 80 percent of you, but which pissed off the military and everybody else because it was their families too. It was on the list. It wasn't all over the world, guys. It was right here in America. Yep. That was a farce. They were not trying to get rid of all the people in the world, 80% of the people in the world. That was a propaganda. They were trying to get eight, rid of 80% of the people here. So it's not really an Illuminati? All those are, um, okay, so, so the local RR is the registered agent? No, don't go Don't go that way. Um, all you got to do is get a hold of the, uh, uh, find out who the railroad is, and go ahead and call them and find out who their insurance company is. They're going to ask, we got a claim? I will. <laughs> because that's fraud in the factum, fraud in the inducement, and fraud in the local contracti, period, from start to finish on any mortgage. You said I own the, house, the land. The deed says that I am the legal owner and the grantee of this, uh, of this thing, this deed, and you come back, and when I don't pay you rent, you call me a tenant. That's fraud in the factum, fraud in the inducement. That is uh, uh, theft by deception. And that's, uh, that's uh, um, what do you call that, uh, interfering with uh, 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 public documents. It's filing a false documents, what that is. Can I ask you to say it again also, a little slower? It's on it'll be on the recording, you can listen to it. Thank it you. This is being recorded and it'll be out there. Beg pardon. Yeah. Okay, fraud and factum, fraud in the inducement, fraud dans locum contracti, that's a Latin term for fraud fraudulent contract. Um, they put in there that you were the on, on the deed, they put in there that you were the grantee. Okay, when you and you had legal title in fee simple, which is fine. Nothing wrong with fee simple, uh, as long as the, uh, the the clauses in there uh, are not too uh, constrain, uh, uh, constraining to you. Okay, um, it could be an absolute or whatever it is, uh, and it says it goes to your heirs and the signs forever. Every one of them say that. All right, and that be the case. How in the hell do they turn around and call you a tenant? That's fraud. That's fraud in the factum right there. That means that that uh, that that uh, um, that deed said you were the legal owner, and uh, turned around and call you a tenant. Think about it. That's called bait and switch, also. Yep. That means the railroad company has uh, has um, uh, filed false deeds. And guys, the railroad the railroad company also went in and got rid of all the deeds of all the black people, black families in the southern states. They went in and burned them all and then put their deeds in place in that same place. Yep. We proved That's that how they took over ago. town. Yep. We That's right. That and then fact. they ran a railroad through that through that town. Y'all follow what's going on here? Yes. Because black people had no no intention of having a railroad coming through their town. They didn't care. So when that happened, they went into the courthouses, they burned all their deeds, put their deeds in place, and threw a railroad in it. I've told you, you can't take over a country like this in 50 years without doing something, stepping over a few bodies. And that's what happened on Black Wall Street in Oklahoma also. 
I don't know if anyone ever heard that story, but... Also, guys, every piece of ground that was taken on eminent domain was done under fraud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yep. it was under the guise of a government, and it wasn't. It was all under the guise of, it was all done under the Virginia company. Yep. It was done under a private company, not government. So even if the people agreed to sell their land and got a decent price, there was a fraud in the contract, so therefore it makes the contract null and void. Right, because they, they thought they were giving it to government, and they weren't. We haven't had a government up here since 62 when they when they walked out and never never reconvened until very recently. All this family has to do is bark and say, everybody walk out, and everybody walks out. It was their government. They set it up. If they want to change the form of government, they have everybody walk out and reform it. It's theirs, guys. What I'm saying is, how did the Federal Reserve and uh, uh, J.P. Morgan go in there and make it illegal for anybody to use that type of paper in Congress, unless it was your Congress? Unless you set the Congress up. You set the whole government up under the, under the Virginia Company. You turned a company into a government. Then use the same telegraph and, and telephone system to run that all over the country and sell this farce to everybody. That's called misrepresentation. And say, you're the one being represented. And then calling you the people. We the people. You believed it. it. Had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with the trusts that owned the railroads and the people that owned those trusts. It'll start sinking in in here in a minute. <laughs> how how uh, bad this is, or or these trusts that own people. Uh, we have been their cash cows. We have been their inventory. Yep, and they did all of this under the on the pretense of reconstruction in 1864. Yeah, reconstruction of their own government into a tyrannical dictatorship through Lincoln. And then here's uh, Blue. He comes to, oh, uh, he says, oh, yeah, that's how they stole my granddad's property, next to the railroad tracks with highway plans. But then uh, 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 reneged on, uh, on, and now there's a car lot there in Missouri. That's where they charge leases to, and fees, too. Everything is designed to get you off your land so they can lease it back to you. They don't want to take it. They just want to lease it to you. Yep. Keith, so what happens when these plain facts are presented to the military. The military, the Navy, the Army, the US Air Force, etc., they're just corporations as well, right? I mean, do they have any duty to the Confederacy? I mean, when we present these facts to them and, and the things that we've been exposing, are they duty-bound to honor an original oath, um, even though their oaths these days are to the corporation? I mean, what makes them pay attention they are duty bound to the original confederacy to the law of nations and international law and none of that has been followed in these in these areas in the railroad area none of it's been followed so uh, with that said, is it one of the things that may be holding back the Navy or the military is that maybe we need to give them amnesty and but to to the American people, but state that any uh in house issues they can take care of. Well, they get, um not, I, I, I wouldn't this. yeah, I would not go over I would not go over any type of plans in any way, shape or form over recording and dealing with the Navy if we ever decide to deal with the Navy. I understand. See, because uh, uh, because uh, I don't know um, what their reaction would be. I do understand every statement they've made in the last two years. Now, okay, I did not completely understand it a week ago, but I fully understand everything they're saying now. And I mean, they could they could write one sentence that would know exactly what they're talking about. <coughs> And they have mentioned this over and over. They just could not come out and tell people everything that was going on. (sighs) 
Okay, so um, as, yeah, as far as that stuff's concerned, I mean, I don't have any open line with them, uh, with the Navy in any way, shape, or form. I don't think anybody else here does e- either. It's possible they could listen to this recording, and it's possible they could come to us and say, hey, uh, we get what's going on here, and, yeah, we need to do something. But they can't work with you if you don't know what the hell you're talking about, if you don't get it. And that's what I'm trying to do with all the people that have done the resident declarations um, and have come over to the United States of America. And I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to get everybody, sit them down, and say, here, this is what I found out. Here's the information. Go look at it. Okay? And so everybody's on the same page. So if the military comes out and says something, we know exactly what they're talking about. Everybody there does, knows exactly what's going on. Does anyone understand the, the JAG organization, the military sort of attorneys? Where does it trace its roots back? You know, what date? Is it Confederation? Is it uh, Corporation post-1860? Yeah. yeah, Judge Advocate General was started by, uh, by uh, Lincoln. So 62. Okay, and that was done under, yeah, yeah, that was done in 1862, and uh, it was started by Lincoln. And it was done uh, that way to um, put the original Confederacy in trust. That's how I understand it, and that's how I was told. Now, whether that's absolutely true or not, I do not know, but that's what I was told by people who were consultants with the Navy. Okay, Um, uh, They said that that's that's what happened, and it happened in the railroad naval yard. (laughs) Well, it seems that we should research this and, and see if we can figure that out because if they are supposedly protecting the original trust of the Confederacy, then it would seem that that is something we can stand on. Right. Um, okay, I'm getting some of these things. It says, our original understanding of letters and acceptance and acknowledgement are still valid then? Yes, absolutely, guys. Everything we've done up to this point is absolutely valid. We don't have to change a thing. This is not new information that's going to cause us to have to revamp things. It is what it is. It's exactly where we are. We're doing just fine. We have, don't have to change a thing in what we're doing and anything as far as letters of acceptance, as far as the, the, um, uh, the process by which we uh, settle the states, the counties, or anything else. We're going to have to deal with this deed issue, okay, and there's fraud in them. There's fraud in the deeds, okay, and there's fraud in these foreclosures, and there's fraud in the cars and everything else. When are the mineral rights released? That's what I want to know. That's question number one. The one who had the mineral rights that made the car, when are those mineral rights released or are they forever? And if they're forever, prove they're forever. How does one man get mineral rights to something in order to secure the delivery of those of those minerals and then keep uh, um, uh, that claim on the mineral rights all the way through its life? Now, come on. It's no. got to stop somewhere. The only way he can do that is through lease. He never sells it. First, he'd have to go back and prove his original claim. Mm-hmm. That, that's right. He'd absolutely have to prove his original claim. These are the things that we challenged, and these are the things that we've challenged in that international complaint. All we have to do is redirect the international complaint to read the railroads. Mm-hmm. And that international complaint is is not 99% dead on. The the uh, Vatican has been operating by doctrine of discovery for hundreds of years, but there is law that is in place prior to the doctrine of discovery. Indigenous peoples across this country have claim that is greater than anything the Vatican has or its people. Okay. But does it overcome a mineral rights claim? There's your there's your question. That's what I'm wondering. If if it overcomes a mineral rights claim, how do you overcome a mineral rights claim? Can can oh, we create treaties between indigenous nations who have never surrendered their sovereignty here? Um, 
Well, I, I'm sure that anything we do is, is uh, pretty much, uh, um, I'm, you know, I guess we have a choice to do whatever we want to do. We can enter into treaties, whatever treaties we want to enter into. Um, yeah. With whomever we want to enter treaties with. There's, there's more than 900 American Indian tribes across the country. Most of them uh, have surrendered to the boot um, of the uh, oh, Indian Affairs Bureau of Indian Affairs. There's a few. There's a few who have never surrendered their sovereignty, and their claim predates anything that these nine families may have or the Vatican may have. Okay, check it out. Um, you just said that uh, the boot of Indian Affairs, you know where that started? Yeah, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I, I believe um, even Lincoln, his order has never been rescinded to wipe out all the American Indians. Listen to what you're saying. No, that, the United States and Congress assembled, was put together to deal with Indian Affairs. That office came from the original Congress. That's why they were assembled in the first place, the Continental Congress was to deal with the revolution, deal with the war, and to deal with uh, uh, Indian affairs. That's our jurisdiction, not theirs. They didn't surrender to anything, because we never uh, overtook them. They never surrendered their rights. They never surrendered anything when they went into uh, uh, Indian affairs. I mean, we, that's, that's a whole other can of worms, and we've been on this call for, uh, well, since about 7.20. It's about almost 9.15 now, so, um, I, you know. If you want I'm, to end it, just end it. No, I don't want to end it just yet because there's probably still some more calls. I do want to say one thing, though, I'm talking about next steps, uh, what's going to be real important for all of us, and that is for folks uh, that are listening to this call that don't know what to do, they need to go to uh, generalpost.org, and they need to do their resident declaration. And then once those resident declarations are done, we need to get your state on. We've got to redo your constitution. Yeah more, and more, yeah, more and more stuff is going to be coming out, guys, on this and how to deal with it. Like I said, this is two days old. Uh, the book's been out for a long time, but we've got to get up to speed on what's going on. And we'll have more answers and everything, just like everybody on this call needs to start studying this thing and, and learn how to do it because we need more minds on this. We need everyone on this thing, everyone. We need the states. We need, the, we need the states up and running with, with a population in them. Excuse me, Lenny. This is Michael Scott. Hey, or, uh, or Keith. Um, I understand that Darcy said that uh, California Republic's uh, been signed and all, and uh, I think Paul and I had planned, I think, during the weekend we were going to sign um, constitutions in some capacity and that we didn't get that taken care of at that time unless he had done it since then. And so I wanted to know about the California or uh, Republic and how that transpired and what we need to do further on that. You just need an instrument of adherence to the uh, original articles and the Articles of Confederation as amended. That's all you need to do. Now it's got that in progress, uh, Mike. Say it again. Now it's got those documents in progress. Oh, okay, great. All right, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we go ahead and end the recording, and um, we'll, put, we'll post this recording e either on the website or the blog or both. And I don't know if you want a copy of it, RJ, to put on your site, but we can give you a copy and just kind of get it circulated out there. Ab absolutely send it, and I'll be happy to post it. Okay. Any last parting thoughts there, Keith? Do what? I'm sorry. <laughs> I I'm asked sorry. if there were any sorry. last parting thoughts. Keith, John, anybody? Oh, else? no, 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 no. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, uh, you know, we can talk about this uh, as we're on, talking on the phone here. All right. Well, Once that's a recording. We can still talk about it. That's going to end this recording. We thank you all for listening.
This is Florida One. It's 5:26 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You are on a unmuted, I mean an unmoderated conference call. You can hit star six to unmute yourself and talk. Anyone on this call? Yeah, I'll tell you, brother. Who else is on here? So what did you think? Did you hear the whole thing? I got to hear part of it then. I had to cut out for a little bit. But uh, it's a lot of information I didn't know about that uh, would be a bad idea researching on it and verifying. Yeah, well, it's verified. Because more people are made aware of that, that uh, that stuff was done behind our backs, back in that far back. That, that might be the tool to wake people up to what's going on. Well, that's why it's out there. That's why we put it out there. I think they put it on the... I think they're releasing it or something. I don't know. I'm hoping so. Can you hear me? Yeah, who am I speaking with? This is Florida One. Yeah, I missed the one. I can hear you. Who else? Yeah, who else was talking there? Uh, that's, uh, that's me. I'm Nick. Nebraska. What's going on, Nate? Hey, where do I find that uh, that link to that guy's stuff? Oh, we have that on the MP3. Is everybody else's phones cracking up? Yes. Who's is that? It's all of our phones, I guess. So the whole line. It's all of them? All of us been acting up like that. All night, pretty much. That's odd. So anyway, what was that guy's name that was that was talking about all that? Oh, I forgot. Man. I have to it's ask. On the conference, I just have to go back and listen to it all over again. Or what? Yeah, it's on one of the conference calls. Man, that's interesting stuff. So who's all on right now? I don't know. I can't hear a thing. So it's static. You can't hear me? I can hear you off and on, but I hear a whole lot of static. Dang, just me? Or everybody? No. Well, I can only hear you. Are you Florida one? Yes. Yeah, you're the only one I, I hear. Speak up, man. The other guy, speak you up. See? Yeah, you're the only one I can hear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Y'all can't hear each other? It's all static, other than when you talk. Huh. I wonder why that is. It's been doing that all night? Yeah, we had some weird stuff going on earlier. Did Blaine come on tonight? Yep. Yeah, he sure did. Did you 
you guys talk about the drone strike rumor? Yes, and it's fake. Yes, it is fake. It's, it, it is. But it was uh, it was put on an Oath Keepers. Uh, you you heard all that, right? Yeah, but they were hacked, I believe. Yes, that's that's true. Yep. Well, I already knew that they were hacked because as soon as I seen it, I figured that. I actually posted it on their page. Don't listen to this. This is bull crap. It's hacked. Yep, yep. Well, I I put I put through a couple questions to some oath keepers on the ground there and a couple of militia, and they didn't even know what I was talking about. Uh, they hadn't heard of it. But. Did you guys see Stuart Rhodes' interview with um, Chuck Smith on his channel where Stuart Rhodes actually verified that it was true and it wasn't hacked or anything? I was just, that burned me sideways. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, that's because it was an on an oath keeper site, and, and Stuart Rhodes, you know, is found at those keepers and so he probably trusted that it was coming from one of his guys that's my assumption I don't know yeah. I didn't watch the interview huh yeah I didn't even know who he was until like a day and a half ago because he was interviewed a couple of times at the ranch like last week so I was like who it was yeah Stuart Rhodes is the founder of Oath Keepers okay Good morning, Big Red Logistics One, checking in. Hello. Just letting you guys know I'm on the call. <clears throat> Just calling in for an update, see what's going on. You guys were having a discussion earlier. I didn't want to interrupt. No, you're fine. I'd like to get. Uh, I'd like to know who that guy was that that was on that recording, though. I'd like to research, read some of his stuff. Nobody knows where I can find his info at. Everything you see right there was on here. It's all on the recording. Well, I'm curious about what he was talking about. I came halfway into it. This is Big Red. I work, uh, my carrier works hand-in-hand -hand with Norfolk Southern. He was talking about the railroads and the family, so I was a little curious about what kind of involvement they have with the... The with whatever he was talking about. The railroad is owned by nine, basically nine people. And I don't know how to explain it like he did, but anyway, there's a book on the whole deal, and you could get it on Amazon. I forgot the name of man. I remember it. I just, yeah, I'm just looking for like a brief synopsis so I have an idea what the hell he was talking about. I only caught a little bit of it. Is it, is it like nine families that go back to the Confederacy, what he was talking about, or what? Yeah, it's not a family that goes back to all that, to the railroad and where they took it from all the black people. They didn't want the railroad, and they took all their land, and how the Confederacy was done and all that is the book that was released from a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. And uh, the person that asked, because she was on the call the night that that got recorded, I got off of it. I, I, well, actually, I was still on it. I fell asleep <laughs> uh, when they were talking about the railroad. But uh, Barbie, we put that on so Barbie could take a nap. <laughs> no, okay. And I stayed up to take over for when it went off. Well, I worked for the railroad, and that's what got that's what has me interested. Well, I mean, I'm interested yeah. anyway, but I mean, being work, being an employee at the railroad, I've kind of. Well, my my sole business relies on the railroad, so that's why I'm very interested in it. I mean, my money that I give to my family to, and my employees' family to stay afloat comes from the railroad, and if it's through dirty money, it's actually really going to piss me off. Well, I, yeah, that's where I get all all my support from my family. I, I work the railroad. And Warren yeah, Buffett I'll, owns us, supposedly. Well, uh, Norfolk yes, Southern is the, the carrier that carries all my equipment. I'm with BNSF. Uh, you got a mission one. I tell you the name of that book and the author. If you're interested. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. 
It's on Pandora's Box, The Hidden Truth by Christopher Oh, I've Kelly. heard of that book. Yeah, I've heard of that book, Pandora's Box. Over there. Somebody's outside or around some kind of machinery, because that's all I'm hearing is like tire sounds or something. Yeah, it's been like that since I've been on. Actually, that sounds like a snorer. Yeah, it could be. It's yeah, probably be far. Far the phone next to her head. Hold on. Probably. Hold on, hold on a second. I'm going to mute out for five seconds. Tell me if it ends. I don't hear anything either. Hey, I was going to tell you guys, I don't know what phones, you can go to iPhone or Android and there's this thing called Red Phone or Red SMS. It's totally encrypted and the NSA cannot listen to you or read your text messages. So, I'm not afraid of the NSA reading my text messages. <laughs> Or I'm listening well, to my I'm phone saying. calls. There's nothing for them to find. And I'm, I'm sure I'm already on a government list. Let them come to my door. It's already on record. They know where I stand, and they better bring a SWAT team. <laughs> Pretty much plain <laughs> and simple. Yep. My call would probably say I'm in Ukraine right now. <laughs> well, I've done nothing wrong. But and I think it, I'm very active in the Second Amendment community in Pennsylvania, so I'm, I know I'm I'm on the list with a lot of Pennsylvanians. So, do you know who else is on the list? Any Christian Look, man, in this I country? I run 85 Second Amendment pages, so I know I'm on the damn list. <laughs> well, listen though, if you've read the terror, the, 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 what they have labeled as the terrorists, so, you're, if you're a Christian, you're on that list. There's so, yeah, if you have the gun, you're on that list. Got off the other day. Seventy-two, uh, seventy-two things that is considered a terrorist. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah, ridiculous no, no, that they real. have these lists. And that, and that's why I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I've been in. I don't know who, who all has me on Facebook. Facebook but I, um, but I, I'm a, I'm not, I'm kind of, a, I'm against uh, Operation American Spring in a way because I think it's a trap. And I think that NDA has a lot to do. I think it's a way of rounding up everybody in one place and and, uh, and starting the arrest because that's what they want. But I don't know. Well, I have a I have an interesting theory that I I push to um, a lot of militia units. Everybody is under some kind of form of financial issues where they can't afford a whole lot. Typically, I have about 150 to 200 dollars a week that I can spend on myself, and that's even a lot compared to a lot of families. If you don't have a lot of money, save up and buy yourself most of the gun rifles. They're good. They're good shooting rifles. I mean, I want to tell you, gun guys, you all know this. But here's what I've oh, been yeah. doing every week for the last like three months. I've been buying a Mosin the gun and a spam can for my local for my local guy, and he's laughing. He's like. Why the hell do you need all these mows and the guns? And I keep telling him, well, I'm a collector. He's like, yeah, but there's nothing special about them. I said, well, they're going to be special one day. And I just wink at him, and he, he, knew, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> How much do they cost? Uh, about $110, depending where you're at in the country. Yeah. One thing you want to look at is the Scout Scope. They made from the model between 1932 and 1943. The sponsor side does not have to modify the bolt at all. Yeah, you, you just got to look at the, um, you got you to check the barrel condition. Get yourself a 7.6254 round. Ask the guy if you can drop it down the barrel. Not the receiver side, but just put the, the bullet in the end of the uh, the muzzle there. And if it drops all the way in down to the casing, you got you got a shitty board. I'll buy it. That's how I pick mine out. And the guy laughs at me because they do it every week. He's like, are you, what are you looking for? I'm like, well, I want to see if it's counterboard out bigger than the bullet is. I mean, if as long as it doesn't drop through, it'll shoot straight. You just got to figure out where it shoots. And to be honest with you, most armed conflict nowadays would be between 100 and 300 yards anyway. So 
that's why uh, that's why I'm picking them up. They're cheap, and you can carry a lot of ammo for them. <laughs> what are they again? Can you say that again? What's up? What they are they again? Mosin What's the Nagat. Yeah, Mosin. Mosin Mo- Mosin the Gat, Mosin. 9130s. Yep. Awesome rifle. Nope. Yep, I, I've like I said, I have probably got about twenty of them by now. I, I, I honestly, I do not have a, an honest count. <laughs> That's how many I have. And you know, you something funny. It, it, there's a card out there that reads the spam can, the symbols on them, mm-hmm. and they've got without this called heated needle core rounds. Those rounds are designed to penetrate four inch flake steel. Yeah, isn't that the seven and one sniper ammunition? I do believe so. It is, they it have to have there's, there's uh there's heavy ball floating around out there too somewhere. It's like the two hundred and five grain ammunition. That'll that that's steel penetrator ammo too. You just gotta find it. It's for the machine guns yep. and it's got a little extra kick out of the rifle, but the bow will hold up. Yep. I'm actually uh, I'm trying to purchase a PSL right now because I can shoot the 147 grain cans that I got. The problem is the PSL I'm looking at is too much fucking money. So I, I have one. I have a former Mosin sniper. What did you call him again, Mosin? What? Hold on. Let me get to my phone. Say it again. Hold on. Give me five. The rifle's accurate. I don't care that it's got the the weld holes in it. I'm just going to have it re-drilled in a different area. And I'm, uh, there's a place called Kalinka Optics online that makes reproduction scopes and uh, makes new scopes with the uh, 76254 reticle for the PSL, the Dragunov, whatever, but in a new scope. And the whole reason for that is the scope's already been is, is set up. The scope is set up for 76254 to include the drop at different ranges. If you have ever looked at a, uh, a Dragunov scope, it's like having mill dots, but it's simpler. They have the, scr- the scale in there, so you can estimate how far away your target is and everything. It, it's absolutely ridiculous, and it's a sniper's wet dream for someone who's not a sniper. Yep, and uh, what is it you want to look into? It, it, what is weird it? name, but the rifle called Mosin Nagat. Nagat in O. N A T O D. Are you sure it's, now, up, it's coming up as N A T O T? Yep. It's Nagant. N A T at the end. N A T N T? Yeah. That's what it was showing up as. That's why I was asking. Yeah, it's a Mose in the God. Most. You, you want to do some research on it before you just buy one generally off the shelf? And you're going to want to learn how to inspect them. I mean, don't be afraid if you find one covered in Cosmoly. What you want to do is you want to try to find one that has a decent bore. That's why I said the um, do the barrel check with the with the bullet on the end. When you drop it down the muzzle, if it only goes in maybe about half of the bullet length, you're fine. If it drops all the way to the casing, you're, that fucking barrel shot. Don't buy it. Yeah, I own a tactical store, so I'm sure I could get a big on good price on Well, the reason why I tell people to buy these rifles is it may not be your primary rifle, but you can arm a neighborhood person. Like, in my neighborhood, my community is not the most, um, it's not the most gun-friendly neighborhood in the world. However, when rule of law collapse, I can arm probably half my frickin' block if it came down to it. Yep, and now, it's, at that at that point, people are going to need to work together, and you're to survive. You're going to need to arm them, and the best way you can do that is with cheap weapons. They still shoot, and they're sem, semi accurate. So you you know for for a skilled marksman, you can definitely use that rifle just fine. It's for the every Joe schmo. You can still hit something with it, but you know with those rifles, you got to remember something. The Russians are very ingenious. They teach, they taught all their sh- soldiers between one and three hundred yards, yards or meters or arsons, whatever the fuck they used, to shoot at the belt buckle, aim at the belt buckle, 
because you're going to hit that person somewhere in the chest because of between one and 300 yards, military rifles are designed to shoot high up to 300 yards. So if you aim at the belt buckle, you're going to hit them in the chest or the head, somewhere in that region. <laughs> That's how they're designed. The AK-47 is the same way. Okay, 1891, 30, 7.60 by 54 hours. Yep, that's it. They also, yep, no. have, uh, they also have them in, uh, in uh, hold on, M9, uh, M9130 slash 30, 7.60 by 54 hours. Those are $139. Yeah, depending where you're at in the country, you'll find them. Sometimes you can go to one into a gun store, find them for under hundred bucks. I mean, they're 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 cheap rifles because there's so many of them on the market. The problem is they're start the markets are starting to dry up a little bit, so they're going up in price. That's why I'm also, jumping all over them now when I when I have a chance. Now, if you want to check one out to be actual like the Dragon rifle. Look yeah. for what's called the Archangel Platform for the moist in the gut. Oh, my God. Yeah, they're sweet. For $79. Yeah. I got a friend of mine who has one in there with the rock soft mount. Dude, that thing is one to the 21st century. It's crazy. <laughs> How is the moist in the gut scope? I, I'm not a big fan of the 3.5 power scope. It works as long as you have an original. I, I do not like reproduction, mainly because it feels cheap. I mean, it'll hold a zero. Don't get me wrong. I have one. I just, something to me, I just, I just don't like it. I, I, I like original equipment. This one's a two-day system. There's a lot of background noise on other. Yeah, that's what I noticed. It wasn't me, I'm muted. And now, if you want another inexpensive rifle to look for, I got mine for 35 bucks back about 10 years ago. Right now, they're going for about 200 But it's a Yugoslavian STS. Yep. Yeah. Very good rifle. It's actually not a bad shooting platform. I really like those. How many rounds does that thing hold? Ten round internal magazine for the uh, SKS. I don't even see it. I don't even see a mag on this one. <laughs> well, the Mo the Mose and the Gun has an internal five round box magazine. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, everybody loves uh, American rifles. Everybody loves, uh, you know, the AK, the M16, you know, stuff like that. I, I personally, I like a good bolt rifle. But, you know, I mean, I've got a couple AKs. i got one AR. I have the big fun toys, but I've always, always gravitated toward the rifles from, like, World War One and Two. I just, I, something about them. You just can't beat a straight shooting rifle. This one looks pretty cool. It's got the thumb, the thumb uh, stock on it or whatever. Yeah, you can do a lot of neat stuff to these rifles. Like the SKS, you can turn it into basically an AK. You put a different stock on it, detachable magazines. This oh, nine yards, yard, you can have a blast with them. Yeah. Honestly, though, if you're going to dump that kind of money into an SKS, you might as well just buy an AK. <laughs> I, I like the SKS as a rifle with the 10-round magazine, and it's semi-automatic. Yeah. Well, I did my modifications to mine. It was still cheaper to do the modifications than buying the AK, because the AK was like around seven, dollars $800. And when I had been modifying mine, I had a total of 230 bucks into it. I bought an AK just uh, at the last gun show I went to for 450 bucks. Yeah, I'm running 30 round magazines at six position stock with a weaver rail. 
And I've got a uh, fly rail on the receiver cover. Nice. Now you've got to be careful of modifying because AT, ATF has certain rules on the SK. This yeah, same, same with so, the AK. So many parts had to say original. Mine's borderline. 